There are a grand total of 68 gig quests in Cyberpunk 2077, with every single one having a bunch of different outcomes, hidden secrets, and references to other gigs or events from the game. This series is going to explore all those details from every gig, as well as assign them as we go to different tiers of brilliance. In this video, we're going to be covering all 9 gigs from the Westbrook district, most of which are issued by Wakako, our fixer based on Jig Jig Street, and I'm going to be running through them in the general order that they're unlocked, since it just makes the most sense from a narrative standpoint. Point. Huge thanks to the Patreon supporters who keep the channel alive, especially during times where I lose my voice and literally can't make videos. I am extremely grateful to you guys. And now, it's time to dive into the hidden secrets and details of all Westbrook's gigs. Starting off, it takes someone very brave, or very foolish, to steal money from the Tiger Claws. And for the Netrunner Vortex, well, that's exactly what she's been doing. In a casino situated under the sewers bordering Westbrook and Arroyo, Vortex has been quietly siphoning funds onto her own cred chip. Right before she's about to get out with her cash though, she's caught, interrogated, and not surviving the interrogation, is discarded in the sewers. Breaking in to find the cred chip for Wakako then, I'd recommend entering via the second sewer tunnel. There's a high tech check, but we can bypass that with a simple hack. Coming up here and dealing with just a couple tiger claws, we'll wind up right where we need to be in the office. I wonder where this highly secretive cred chip will be hiding. Must be pretty well stashed away for the tiger claws not to have found it yet. Oh wait, it's hiding in plain sight right here on the desk. Well then, that was simple. Now at this point, we could just make our way out how we got in, but let's try and learn all the info we can first. So on the office terminal, we can learn that Vortex was literally on the cusp of leaving this casino forever with with who I presume is her girlfriend, Lily. Though too bad flicking over to files, we can see exactly how the Tiger Claws managed to figure out that Vortex was skimming funds. To be fair though, from January to June, the amount Vortex took in that time seems extremely negligible compared to the total. Even added up over years, I can't imagine it would amount to much. Still, Night City is a merciless place. We can also, with the right dialogue, ask the bartender exactly what happened to Vortex. He says this. This Vortex you care so much for, she cheated them, okay? So they threw her body in the sewer. Same spot the kitchen dumps used cooking oil. Bodies there don't last long, that's all I know, so fucking leave me alone. So, with nothing more to do in here, I headed out to try and find Vortex's body. Unfortunately, I dug up nothing, just a huge pool of blood in the second sewer. I did, however, find a male body down here at the end of the sewer outside, one who annoyingly can't be scanned and has nothing interesting to loot. Coincidence? Perhaps. Perhaps not. Could have been someone looking for Vortex, and I'd suggest Lily, but I'm fairly certain Lily is exclusively a female name, so who knows. Only other potential lead I could find was this convo from the Under the Bridge Cyber Psycho mission. It's about a guy who pulled a young runner from the sewers. Could that be in reference to Vortex? Again, without more solid evidence, we can't know for certain. The sewers are a ways away from this bridge, but again, who knows. Either way, back to the gig, deposit Vortex's shard at a nearby drop point, and Wakako will call you up, expressing her gratitude. Overall, with the underground casino, multiple approaches, and allure of a wider mystery, I drank this a solid B tier gig. Good at the time, but not the most memorable afterwards. A classic kidnap and rescue scenario next, we have your wife plays out exactly how you'd guess. We break into a compound where a guy's wife is being held prisoner, and, well, we rescue her. Bradley Costigan is the guy in question, a criminal behind bars who turned down the Tiger Claw's request to shiv some snitches. Now, they've kidnapped his wife, and are using her as leverage to force him to cooperate. As usual, we can blitz in through the front gate, and as usual, I'm gonna deem it more interesting to take the stealthy route over a barrier to the left. Now, this gig's got a few in interesting finds as it goes. The place they're holding Bradley's wife Lauren is, in actual fact, a katana manufacturing plant, so now you know where a lot of those katanas that enemies are using actually came from. Of notes to be found here is one of many communications from Jitaro Shobo, the awful Tiger Claw boss whom we're sent to kill during the Monster Hunt gig in Kabuki. As though this guy wasn't already screwed up enough, he's now requesting a custom-made item that sits somewhere between a katana and Sir John Falastiff. Well, I guess it's true what Woodman said back at Clouds. Some fetishes really are unheard of. We can also find the full catalogue of katanas they have on sale in a file on the nearby terminal. The Heaven Storm one sounds especially interesting, said to be enchanted with the souls of lesser demons known as cellar imps. Well, funnily enough, down in the cellar are some workers forging new katanas. Perhaps they're the ones mentioned? 
No matter. One final terminal actually down in the cellar chronicles how poor Lauren has been trapped here for 30 whole days, refusing to eat for most of them. Well, luckily she's able to walk still because I've just about had it up to here with carrying people out of enemy territory. Escaping the base then, we tell Lauren to contact her family and tell them to also lay low. Her husband Brad really has caused a lot of trouble. No matter, hopefully Lauren should be safe now thanks to V. Overall, this one is a somewhat interesting setting with nice katana related details, but otherwise it's pretty basic and run of the mill. I'm going to call this a C tier gig. Next up, Olive Branch is a gig which I found to be utterly hilarious. It also took me a little while longer to film than most due to a number of different options and very obscure secrets that can be found within it. The premise of this one is that this guy, Sergei, has done more than a few things to piss off the Tiger Claws, so he wants us to deliver this car as a peace offering to them. He's pretty confident that he's in the home stretch now, and with this final act, he'll be in the clear. So pretty straightforward, huh? Hop in the car and drive it to the destination. Except as we're heading there, we begin to hear strange noises coming from the boots. And inside is none other than a man named Alex Pushkin, a corpo who works for Biotechnica. Okay, I gotta say, I love this option the most. We literally find a random man in the boot of our car begging for help, and without saying a word, just shut him back in. No! Let me out! If we do it this way, hand him over as per the gig, then Sergei will be free, we'll get paid almost 3k, and we can find Alex's body dumped in the sewers a while after, holding a data shard containing his cries for help. It's the same location in fact where we find the body which may or may not be tied to the Tiger and Vulture gig. If we let Alex go though, then funnily enough we won't fail the gig. Alex will pay Wakako even more, being a corpo and all, will receive double the amount of money, and it's Sergei's body which can instead be found. This time in a small building out the back of the Dicky Twister Club right by the Delamain HQ. He's holding a shard relaying his attempts to reason with the Tiger Claws, swearing that Alex was in fact in the boot of the car, and the Tiger Claws, not taking him at his word, decided to murder him to death. And I gotta say, I don't have tons of sympathy for the guy. He seemed funny, yes, but he was also a scav by the looks of things, and we know from encounters with those guys that they're literally the scum of the earth, so yeah. This choice then, more money, less work, seems like like a no-brainer, right? Well, hold on just a minute, because we're not aware of all the information at hand just yet. What has Alex done to deserve being thrown into that car? Well, Nomad players amongst us can actually learn of one atrocity that he's committed if they play the game's gigs in a slightly weird order. First, you'll have to complete the guinea pigs gig before this one over in city centre. It's the super complex one where we infiltrate the massive hotel and take out Joanne Coke from Biotechnica, and by completing that gig first as a Nomad, as well as speaking to the hotel clerk at some point during the mission, which is very important for no apparent reason, we can, during Olive Branch, unlock an extra piece of dialogue. Turns out, Alex worked with Joanne on the same project for Biotechnica that we had to kill Joanne for. A downright evil project, as it were, that involved murdering a ton of people from the Red Ochre Clan. Let's hear what he has to say about his involvement there. Biotechnica, huh? Assuming you know Joanne Coke. I do, I do! I did a prim little project with her out in the Badlands. What about you? Yeah. Heard all about that project. Real triumph. Wonder how many from Red Ochre died. You recall? Uh, who can keep track? Besides, they're like roaches. Disgusting things will just multiply again. Yep, and with that, Alex has just sealed his fate for all eternity in my book. Sure, Sergei may be a scav, but Alex? Well, nobody treats my fellow nomads like that and gets away with it. Nobody. Now, I don't know whether to praise or berate this one for such a hidden and missable detail, honestly, but I'm leaning towards praise, plus the fact we can actually see the aftermath of both outcomes and of course hilariously do this, I'm giving this one a solid A+. Greed Never Pays is a perfectly apt title for this next gig, which is going to take place across two locations. First up, an apartment block. No wait, the apartment block where we can rent the Japantown apartment. And you know what? Going ahead and doing that right off the bat should hopefully stop people asking questions about us sneaking around. Now we're here because Wakako wanted a device known as the Lockbreaker, an ingenious piece of tech capable of jailbreaking corpo cyberware. Hopefully Nintendo, uh, I mean Arasaka, don't find out about this, else it's a lifetime of 
overpayments just to make a statement. Anyway, the girl in possession of said tech, Leah Gladden, was on the cusp of selling it to Wakako before all communication was severed. Our job is to find out what happened to her and retrieve the lockbreaker ourselves. Leah's apartment can be found on the first floor and entered via the code 2137 or from climbing through the window outside. Everything looks perfectly normal from the outset, with the classic inconspicuous vending machine in the corner, a staple for all apartments of course, oh, and a big red button, which I'm sure must never ever ever be pressed under any circumstances. So, ah look, a secret room behind the vending machine. Who would have thunk? Anyway, on Leah's main terminal in here, we can ascertain that she in fact backstabbed Wakako after the Tiger Claws offered her three times the amounts of any other buyer. Well, you know what they say, greed never pays. So, heading to the club of Canadomon and taking out the various Tiger Claws inhabiting this very dead night out, we can find the Lockbreaker. Well, 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 Wakako will be pleased. And we can also learn that security in this place is kind of tight because the Tiger Claws actually know they screwed up. They murdered Leah to death the second she sat down before realizing she was under Wakako's protection, after which they sort of panicked and locked the place down. So sadly, Leah had to lose her life and now so do the rest of these guys. Head to the back bathroom and you can in fact find Leah's body seemingly dragged from a nearby booth. She may have been naive, yes, but no way did she deserve this. Now I'm pretty sure she's dead, so I think the kindest thing to do is take her body back to her apartment. I'm just gonna leave her in the car whilst we hand in the lockbreaker, and now we're at the apartment, so let's take her out again, and ah, she's uh, she's gone. I mean, she must be alive and somehow escaped when I wasn't looking then. Literally, that's the only canonical explanation for this, and no, I'm not gonna consider other options. Gig closed. In all seriousness though, this one ain't exactly the most riveting gig in the world. Sure, there's an interesting story behind it, but actual interactions are kind of limited. I do kind of wish we actually could have returned Leah's body somewhere, since picking her up was an option. That would have been cool. Overall though, solid C+. Strap in and get ready to break into one of the nicest apartments in the whole game. That's right, this next one, until death do us part, is set inside a place which, according to a woman outside, costs 400k a month to rent. Just to put that into perspective, the Corpo Plaza apartment that we can rent, which is much, much smaller, costs a mere 55,000 euro dollars. So Emilio and Nina Gutierrez are an ex-couple going through a messy divorce. Nina has taken everything from Emilio, including his car and penthouse, the latter of which contains his depository receipts. Without them, Emilio has nothing to live off. So, it's our task to break into this beautiful apartment, doing our best to keep things hush-hush and grab all the things. Interesting for such an expensive place that there's no elevator security, but I guess that's working in our favor today. Once we're up here, we can enter four different ways. The front door, which has a tech check, the side window with a strength check, the roof with a bigger strength check, or for those with neither of those skills, hopping across to the rear balcony. On site are two drones, one patrol this area and one upstairs. Now I found short circuit had bugger all effect on them, so we're merely gonna have to be stealthy for now. Be careful not to cross these blue lines in the doorways, else you'll trigger the alarm, summon the robot and the drones, and fail the stealth objective. The way to get between inside and out then is this little gap where the blinds are broken. We can also see this issue addressed directly on Nina's computer. Make your way upstairs and disable any cameras stealthily as you do until you reach this back office. Here's where to find Emilio's receipts, but don't skip on access the terminal as well. Here, we can read about just how far Nina is willing to go to ruin her husband's life. She wants alimony payments and is prepared to quit her job and pretend to have a made-up illness in order to secure them. I don't specifically know what Emilio did, but I'm really starting to not like the sound of Nina. Heading into the local network, hitting the emergency reset button will disable all security features, making it way easier to explore this awesome apartment undisturbed. And that's something you want to do because it's literally got a live fireplace. I mean, you know you're fancy when you have something that all peasants from the Middle Ages also had. There's also a second terminal in the bedroom where Nina has sent incriminating evidence on her husband over to Max Jones. Stuff that suggests Emilio was taking bribes from Corpos. Damn, this girl really is trying to destroy his life. Also, Max Jones is the journalist we meet during Regina's Freedom of the Press gig and is one of the few guys brave enough to cover Corpo scandals. One final place you ought to check is this obscure bathroom in the middle of the top floor, as it contains a chest with a piece of legendary clothing. And that stuff is hard to come by, believe me. Anyway, with everything tied up here, simply deposit the receipts outside and you're done. Or so it would seem. 
One final little tie-in for this gig is gonna take us north, to this bridge linking Japantown and Northside. Make your way down to the very base on the Japantown side and approach this pillar. On the ground, we can find a woman who appears to have been thrown from above. She's holding 550 euro dollars and an archived conversation. Turns out, this is none other than Nina Gutierrez, who after Emilio's incessant begging to meet face to face, agreed to come to his requested spot of the Japantown bridge. She wanted to laugh in his face, exercise her power, make him realize that she was going to take everything from him for the rest of her life, and there was nothing, nothing he could do about it. So I guess he threw her off the bridge. Pretty extreme, but I mean she was going to take literally everything. We saw as much from that email about alimony payments. Now, specifying the bridge in the message makes this seem premeditated on Emilio's part, but who knows, could have been spur of the moment, realizing his life was screwed and that this was the only way out. What have I done? Then again, all Nina's actions could have been perfectly justified, but without knowing Emilio's side of the story or exactly what he did, I guess we'll never know for sure. Now, you gotta give merit to this gig on just the apartment alone. I mean, come on, that thing is beautiful. Though, overall, I think not having more details on Emilio's side of things is gonna make this just an A- minus for me. Bugbear, spelt with eights instead of bees, is a netrunner we need to rescue during the gig getting warmer. After crossing the tiger claws during a job and stealing a high-tech Kuroshi van payload for herself, the tigers sought her out IRL to intimidate her for the van's location. To escape them, she ran off into the net and made it so that anybody attempting to pull her out would also kill her in the process and thus never know where the van is hidden. A temporary stalemate, but the tigers know that sooner or later her body will fail if she doesn't leave the net. So we've been sent by Wakako to deal with the tigers and extract Bugbear from the building alive before it's too late. To be fair, for an apartment block, the place ain't too heavily guarded. And before you head to Bugbear's apartment, head to the roof and then to the signal tower just over here for a little hidden detail. You see, we're not the first person Bugbear has enlisted for help. This is a runner friend of hers named Zed, and on his body we can read all about what happened to him. He's disguised himself as a technician and is offering to rescue Bugbear, but only in exchange for getting the location of the Kuroshi van for himself. The two try to negotiate, but before they can get anywhere, Zed is seemingly found and disposed of. Brutal place, Night City. Back to the roof then, dropping down here, we'll have to deal with just one tiger, currently on the phone to his boss. Take him out quietly, and then get to work freeing Bugbear. Now, it's pretty hard to miss her warning, she'll both text you and flash up the instructions on all the monitors, but uh, if you don't want her to die, then inject her with coolant from the bathroom first. If you do, for whatever reason, ignore this though, then the gig will fail, Bugbear will die, and there'll be a plaque at the Columbarium under her real name, Beatrice Ellen Trieste, reading, quote, she finally outsmarted even herself, end quote. Online sources assured me it's there, but I searched multiple times and couldn't find it for myself, so sorry about that. Let me know its exact location down in the comments. Anyway, if you do as any literate person would and call her down, you'll then have to carry her out of there. It's worth scouting ahead beforehand and taking out any tigers blocking your route, especially if you're playing a glass cannon build who can't shoot with bodies like me. Finally then, we'll place her in the boot of a fixer car, and she'll no doubt be transported to a safe and secure facility, and be forced to surrender that Kuroshi van to Wakako. Well, at least she's alive at the end of the day. Now, as intrigued as I am with Bugbear as a character, I did find this gig a little simplistic compared to many others. But then again, sometimes our role as a merc is to enter people's stories for one tiny chapter and not learn what happens afterwards. Still gotta give it a CT though. Wakako's favorite is a nice, chill, combatless gig set down in a very dark cellar of Japantown. The titular Wakako's favorite is none other than a netrunner named Chang Hu Nam. And despite being in Wakako's favor, he hasn't been responding to her messages for a little while. So, caring woman that Wakako is, she's sent us to investigate. Right off the bat, you're gonna wanna make sure to disable these mines leading down into the basement. A fairly obvious but clearly effective precaution. Now, when we get down there, don't be surprised if you have trouble seeing. This is worse with path tracing enabled, but I kept it on as I like the realism it gives to the scenario. First thing we can find is a data shard on Vortex from the Tiger and Vulture gig. Remember whose body mysteriously vanished? And it turns out Wakako hired Chang Hoon for this gig as well. Cool connection. Try to talk to Chang Hoon in his chair and he won't wake. Check his computer and something interesting happens. A single light in the corner of the room clicks on. But first, let's read Chang Hoon's last messages. One is a convo with a runner named Spectral Kid, warning him against 
hacking into a Kang Tao container, and the next two are Wakako asking where Chang Hoon is. No doubt his paralysis has something to do with this mentioned container. So let's follow the lights and find out. They lead us to a maintenance shaft rigged with more explosives, which at the other end leads us into another room containing Chang Hoon's Netrunner shard. Luckily, plugging this in wakes him up. Chang Hoon is thankful for our help and acknowledges Spectral Kid was right in his warning. A few days later, he'll become a Netrunner vendor at the same location with a permanent 20% discount. Perfectly pleasant gig, all's well that ends well. Except there's one more stone for us to turn over here. This online friend of Chang Hoon's, Spectral Kid, well, turns out we can actually find him in game. What's left of him, anyway? Just down from the chapel in Pacifica, in this hidden garage, lying with his brains fried out in a Netrunner chair, is Spectral Kid. Alongside yet another communication between him and Shang Hoon Nam. This time, it's Spectral Kid being warned. Warned not to break into the Voodoo Boy subnet. Fair, we know firsthand they're pretty powerful runners. Shang Hoon even tries to convince Spectral Kid to help out on his job instead, but he ain't having any of it. And, well, you know what they say about Icarus? Yeah, Spectral Kid seems to be Icarus in this scenario. Now, there's one more detail on this which calls into question again if this is in fact the real Spectral Kid or just a proxy, and that is Chang Hoon's notes on trying to pinpoint Spectral Kid's identity. It can also be found back at the gig, and Chang Hoon seems fairly certain that Spectral Kid is no older than 13. I don't know about you, but I'd say this kid looks older than 13 for Defo. Could Chang Hoon be wrong? Also, this document seems to suggest that Chang Hoon was in cahoots with t -Buck. May she rest in peace. I guess it's all too easy to get to know everyone in the Netrunner world. Anyway, that's all I could find on this gig, but if you think there's a deeper layer to dive into here, then please comment below and I'll try to cover it in a future video. And if you want to stay up to date on all my videos covering secrets like this, then be sure to subscribe if you haven't already. As for which tier I'd place this one in, well, it is a very quick and simple gig, but I kind of like that change of pace. Plus, the discount vendor aspect and potentially opening a whole can of worms with this spectral kid mystery makes it a solid B plus from me. A Shrine Defiled is the final Wakako gig that we'll unlock, and to be honest, compared to many others she has to give, I found this one a little underwhelming in terms of being a memorable final gig. The premise of this one is that a Tiger Claw boss known as Taki Kazo is attempting to rule Japantown whilst cutting Wakako out of the dealings. In case you hadn't noticed, Wakako's relationship with the gang is kind of ambivalent. I'm sure she cares about her grandkids in the gang, but beyond that, anyone who gets offed by one of her mercs ain't exactly gonna cause her any loss of sleep. But Taki, well, she doesn't want the guy dead, which is something else we'll get to, but rather she wants to keep an eye on his dealings. So we've got to break into the Shinto shrine where he's based, sneak past the numerous tiger claws, and plant a bug on his computer. Normally, I'd go the easy route and get him via the roof, but in this instance, the roof itself is actually also guarded. Guess we'll have to be very discreet. Now, something I learned after the facts is that if you head into the left building first and take out the guard inside, you can actually disable the entire camera system from the get-go for a much easier time inside the main building. There is a bonus for being stealthy here, but the irony of this is always that you can kill absolutely everyone and leave their bodies on the floor, but so long as you aren't specifically detected, Taki allegedly will still never suspect his computer's been bugged. It's also nice in my eyes to take out the Tiger Claws on behalf of Hidemasa Ayukawa, the monk who runs this little shop at the shrine and is fed up of all these thugs defiling it. Of course, out of respect for his ways though, this ought to be done non-lethally. There's also a couple guards holding this archived convo containing yet another mention of Jotaro Shobo from the Monster Hunt gig in Kabuki. Emon and Minho are two tigers itching to spend some time with Jotaro's new girls. And if you've played that gig, well let's just say maybe these guys don't deserve so much mercy after all. Anyway, plant the bug and get out. Congratulations, Wakako can now listen in on all Takikazo's shady dealings wherever he was during that gig. And now, here's a small thing that doesn't make sense to me. During the Phantom of Night City Cyber Psycho sighting, where we fight the crazy Katana dude, we could find another two conversations relating to Taki Kazo. The first is him voicing concerns that he's being stalked by Norio, the Cyber Psycho that we have to fight. And the second, well, this one straight up says, quote, someone zeroed Taki Kazo yesterday, end quote. And reading the whole thing there, it's pretty clear he was killed by Norio. Now, the thing is, this Cyber Psycho 
Echo mission can be completed both before and after the Shrine Defiled gig. And if done before, it doesn't exactly make much sense Wakako wanting us to bug Taki's place when he won't be holding a meeting ever again. I get why the devs didn't stagger these missions since they're both pretty independent of one another aside from that, but I mean, come on. So many interconnected details and then an oversight like this? Well, I guess we'll have to assume that they canonically take place at least a few days apart, and who knows, maybe there's some cut content relating to Takikazo somewhere on CDPR's cutting room floor. Perhaps we'll find out someday. But for now, just enjoy one of the best katanas in the game, Byako from Wakako, because you've just completed all her gigs. But not quite all the gigs in Westbrook, not yet. Too bad her last one though had to be one of the most forgettable. Taki could have been an interesting character to actually see or possibly meet here, but instead there's nothing or no one really standing out to put this quest above the rest. Not even the cool setting can really save this one. It's a solid C- from me. Definitely one of my favourite of the Westbrook gigs, namely because it involves Rogue, Johnny and a Caliburn, is Family Heirloom. Accessed after completing all gigs for Wakako and located in Charter Hill, this one involves the son of Nancy Hartley, whom we meet during the Kerry questline. Dan is a classic rich kid idiot with no understanding for the value of anything and a major gambling problem to boot. He lost his car in a game against Sixth Street and more importantly a bootleg samurai recording, something that wasn't exactly his to lose. So we have to break into a garage of incredibly dangerous 6th Street gang members, sneak around the back to this locker and retrieve the lost items. Right off the bat, I'd recommend hopping into this office via the door or window and disabling the security cameras. It'll make things way easier. Equally, you could just do a Danny DeVito though and start blasting. There's no stealth bonus here after all. In the back, we've got the recording, the car keys and also Johnny's boots, a crucial piece for the breathtaking achievements. Anyway, at this point, you can simply leave, nobody's forcing you to grab the Caliburn and maybe it'll teach teach this little brat a lesson to suffer consequences for once. Thing is, if you do this, he'll just be a little annoyed, but doesn't really seem to care all that much. Whilst Rogue, on the other hand, will be downright disappointed, berating you for the fact that the car was literally right there. I'd say there's no benefit whatsoever to this, so let's definitely grab the car too. First of all, taking out Wyatt Alkin, the guy who won the car in the first place, we can learn that he was attempting to sell it off to none other than Muammar El Capitan Reyes. Reyes, simply calls the guy a loser and blocks him. What a chad. All that's left to do now is hop in the car and drive it to Dan, who couldn't even be polite enough to conduct our meeting sober. Well, at least at the end of the day, everyone's happy, apart from that Wyatt dude and the rest of 6th Street. But we, on the other hand, are over 11k richer. Damn, Rogue sure doesn't skimp on payments. Now, I've straight up got to give this an A ranking. Not so much on unique gameplay, but on the gig's relevance to wider things in the game. Everything ties back to things and people who really matter to us, and for that reason it actually really stands out as important when compared to many of the rest, for which we're merely an outside merc brought into a random situation. But what are your thoughts? Let me know in the comments below your favourite of the Westbrook gigs and why. I plan to cover all gigs like this, with individual videos covering each of the regions of Night City. I've already covered a bunch more already, and I gotta tell you, there's a lot more nuance to this game than it's given credit for. Hopefully the DLC will be able to flesh things out even more. Anyway, massive thanks again to the supporters over on Patreon. I've literally been unable to speak for the past week, and I still sound very croaky even now. And Patreon is great in times like these when I can't release videos for an extended gap. So thank you to you guys because you're all awesome. I'm Sam Bram, I hope you've learned some new stuff about Cyberpunk today, and I'll be doing some videos on Jedi Survivor for a bit as well, so look out for those if that's a game you're also interested in. And I'll see you very soon in another video.